Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here. My name is Caitlin Donaldson. I'm the curator for the Lorraine Historical Society. Thanks everyone who's joining us live today, September 15th, 2020, for our program on Lorraine's very own Helen Steiner Rice. If you're here with us now, then you know that this program today is free for everyone. This is an online ad adaptation of our third Tuesday program series, which we moved to being all online during COVID. Our museum reopened to the public in August, but we will continue hosting our third Tuesday programs online for the remainder of the year. Our upcoming programs will be in October, Vintage Halloween, and in November, in November World War I Veterans from Lorraine, which will be pre presented by LCC professor, Dr. Craig Sensel. If you're interested in supporting the museum during these times, please consider becoming a member, renewing your membership early, or donating to our annual appeal. Any support is greatly appreciated. One of the best ways to stay up to date um, on what we're offering is to join our e-news list. So you can join by emailing info at lorrainehistory.org and ask to sign up. And as we go along, if you have any questions or comments, feel, please feel free to use the chat feature. My coworker, Bethany uh, Tober, is monitoring the chat and will ask questions to me at the end. And if you have any tech issues, she can try her best to help. So thanks again, everyone. Um, let's get started. So I'll start with a little introduction. I'll go over Lorraine, what Helen, life was like in Lorraine when Helen was growing up here, uh, Helen's influence and advocacy in her first career, uh, briefly pause on her marriage, her life working at Gibson greeting cards, and then I'll share some memories from people who knew her, and then finally we'll conclude with her legacy in today. Many of the personal quotes and photographs and stories that I'm sharing today come from a recently donated Helen Steiner Rice collection, and for which we are thanks to the estate of Helen's sister, Gertrude Steiner. Although this is a presentation primarily about Helen, you can learn a lot about someone through their relationships. So we'll also be sharing a bit about Gertrude, or Gertie, as well. So what I'm drawn to about Helen is her drive, her power, her personality, and her wit. I hope that by the end of the program, you will have a better understanding of not only her character, but an understanding of her complexity as a person and the value of using your life experiences and talents to help others. Someone that achieves any level of fame will almost certainly have their public and private persona. So I'm hoping to shed some light on the private parts of her life so that you could come to know her as, as all people inherently are, a complex person. Helen was born May 19th, 1900 in Lorain, Ohio. At the time, Lorain was a rapidly growing city. The steel mill, American ship, and a score of other industries were recent establishments or were soon to be established. Lorain was booming. So pictured here is Lorain's downtown area along Broadway in 1910, and then also a tug pulling a ship through the old swing bridge on the Black River. Helen was born to parents John Steiner and Anna Bieri. Pictured in the middle of the slide is a young Helen. And then in the photograph with John, he's the man on the left. John worked for the B&O Railroad, and before Anna married, she worked in a sewing room in Cleveland, which was a business establishment that catered to wealthier women. She soon turned into a much sought after designer. Her marriage to Helen's father, John, slowed her career. However, I like to think that Helen inherited her mother's eye for fashion. The Steiners lived on Reed Avenue, and the sisters remember walking to First Methodist Church on Sundays. The family German Bible is pictured here in the center of the slide. When speaking of her maternal grandmother, Helen said in her memoir, of all my grandparents, only Grandma Bieri has a special place in my memory. That is because she lived with our family in Lorraine from, a from time to time. Always I'd find her bent over her large German Bible, which rested on a stand near the window. Sunday nights, we'd have our family worship time, Without fail, I'd climb up on a chair and preach using all the Bible verses I knew. This pleased my grandma greatly, and with adoring eyes, she would tell mother in German how that girl can preach. 
On the right is a photo of Helen and Gertie when Helen was around 10 or 12. In an interview, Helen said, mother thought one should always look his or her best. She would not go outside the house without arranging her hair, putting on her face, and carefully choosing a dress. And she insisted that Gertie and I take the same pains with our appearance. I was a willing follower. Gertie resisted. She was too busy with her young friends to worry about vanity. In Helen's senior year at Lorraine High, she decided to go to Ohio State to become a lawyer and then become a congresswoman. She was likely inspired by Jeanette Rankin, a suffrage leader from Montana, who in 1916 became the first woman elected to Congress. We see in her 1918 Simeter yearbook that in a poem, which was possibly written by her, but it's not signed, where she is described as a suffragette. The right for women to vote was a long battle for equality, which was finally passed in 1919 and went into effect in 1920. I find her legal and political aspirations inspiring when you consider Ohio women did not have the right to vote yet when she had these dreams. Her dreams also made it into the paper, the clipping you see here. She commented on an article, probably this one, saying, a news item in the Lorraine paper announced with a substantial headline that a Lorraine girl was planning to study law, the emphasis being on the word girl. I had never let my sex deter me from any goal and I was sure it wouldn't make me any less effective as a lawyer. Fortunately, however, her life changed forever when tragedy struck her family in 1918 with the sudden death of her father. He died from the Spanish flu. This tragedy hit her family very hard. To support their family, Helen and Gertie both worked after their graduation to support their mother and each other. Since this is a timely topic for today, our best estimates in Lorraine are about 200 people died of the Spanish flu. Lorraine nearly closed in October of 1918 with schools, churches, and theaters all closing down. And then moving on to her first career. Her father's passing marks an important change in the trajectory of Helen's future because as a result, Helen did not go to college. However, shortly after she received a phone call with a job offer from the Electric Light and Power Company of Lorraine. They called Lorraine High School's Home Economics Department to ask for someone good with fashion, and they recommended Helen. A new and popular activity at the time was making decorative lampshades, and they wanted someone who could lead classes to teach women how to make their own as well. Helen was quoted later as saying, of course the light company wasn't interested in interior design. They wanted to sell appliances, which would increase the consumption of electricity. So while in this position, Helen entered a window decorating contest and wrote a poem for it, and she won, and won $30. From then on, decorating the display windows was her responsibility. That opportunity opened the door for writing the company's newspaper ads and then to sales, and then becoming their top salesperson selling appliances. Helen said over the next couple of years, I won several more prizes for advertising and sales, but it was a 1924 contest co sponsored by Forbes magazine, which provided a career changer. Writing on the subject, how sound public relations can be de developed and maintained, I received a special award and a trip to Atlantic City for the presentation. In addition to my work for the light and for the light company, I had been writing and publishing some greeting card verses for the Midwest Pub Publishing Company and doing some speaking public speaking in, around the state. But when I won the Forbes Prize, speaking opportunities flooded in. So the photograph here was taken while she was in Atlantic City. I'd like to also point out that the article on announcing her Forbes Prize was published July 1st, 1924. And that's just a couple days after the Lorraine tornado struck. So you can imagine all that was on Helen's mind at the time. But after a speaking engagement in Washington, D.C. for a national gathering of electric railway officials, Helen was invited with a group to visit the White House, and she got to stand in a photograph next to Calvin Coolidge. I've searched everywhere for this photo, but I don't, I don't have a copy of it. But she says after this engagement, more speaking requests came in from across the country. Oh, I want to point out that if my little photo box is right in the way of what you want to look at, you can just click me and drag me somewhere else, just an FYI. In her memoir, she says, because I have enjoyed meeting people and because I care about them, my evolution from public utilities employee to full-time public speaker was a natural one. 
Forming my own lecture bureau, I drew on my background in public relations and advertising to tout Helen Steiner. Lecture titles that she gave include Living and Working Enthusiastically, Do You Know Your Business or Do You Love It? The Man May Pay, but Remember It's the Woman Who Buys, Feminizing Your Business, and Blue Eyes or Gray Matter. And the last one was presented before scores of largely male audiences urging men in management positions to wise up in their practices in hiring and promoting women. The more you expect of women, I told them, the more they will accomplish and the more your companies will benefit. There's nothing wrong with pretty blue eyes in business if there is gray matter behind them. I also believe that Helen was intentional in her choice of style and clothing. She knew her dress would impress men while also she, she was still able to fit in with women. For example, this is a review from one of her speaking engagements. It is a pleasure to see a girl who has succeeded in business as you have and who still keeps her femininity. If more women would follow your views regarding dressing and acting like men, the world would be much more beautiful, a much more beautiful place to live. So I believe she knew how she was being perceived. However, she stayed true to herself, embracing color coordination and fancy hats the whole way throughout her career. I have a few other samples of reviews from her speaking engagements. One is from a newspaper in New York City called The New Eve. This one says, the New Eve is certainly, certainly to be congratulated on having won your enthusiastic interest. If you go at everything the way you have at boosting us, and my hunch is you do, you ought to be the first woman president of the United States and a chairman of the board of the League of Nations and a few other things like that. A Rotary Club said, Miss Steiner has a way of making her hearers swall swallow bitter bitterly interesting truths without effort or pain. Every club should hear her story, the point of, view, point of view being highly interesting. The Denver Post said, Ms. Steiner can stand up before a man's luncheon club and make a speech which a technician would revel in listening to. She can go from meeting to meeting, speaking in their languages. Friday, she made a grand success at two appearances. The meeting broke into cheers when Helen E. Steiner presented her views. Part of her talk was done very cleverly in rhymes and her remarks delighted the audience. In Toledo, they said, Miss Steiner more than fulfilled expectations, which is doing a whole lot, for she had to live up to a cut of a pretty girl, which we published last week, and had to overcome a feeling among our members, yours truly included, that an address by a woman would be anything but interesting, and possess a voice which would circumvent the poor acoustic properties of the dining room. But as we stated, Miss Steiner more than fulfilled expectations. She was great. And then this is a business card to go along with her brochure advertising her speaker series. More pep, more power, more zip, more zest for you and your business. Helen Elaine Steiner's messages are snappy, scintillating, and satisfying. Peppy talks for all occasions. And on the reverse of this card, you would see that she charged $50 to $75 per engagement, which is about $1,000 today. She was quoted later as saying, some have suggested I was 50 years ahead of my time, a feminine of the 20s. I don't know about that. I just saw bright women being overlooked because of sex, and I thought it was terribly stupid and wasteful. The difference between myself and some others was probably my willingness to stand up and say it. Stand up and say it. Of course, women were coming in into, into their own then. Susan B. Anthony didn't get the 19th Amendment to the Bill of Rights ratified in 1920 without the support of millions of women. I love this article here. So this article titled, because the men won't let us, is an interview from an article in Business Magazine in 1926. So Helen's 25 or 26 at this point, and it, this article is quite fun to read. When asked by a somewhat incredulous reporter, what do businessmen think of these ideas of yours? Do you tell these things to businessmen? She answered, I do. I have been telling businessmen all over this country that so long as they persist in keeping capable, intelligent young women at stenographers' desks, they're missing the business opportunities. Do businessmen listen to me? They do. What I tell them is something they already know. What surprises them is that I, a woman, should know something of the things that, for men for years, have been regarding as their own personal information. When asked to describe how her first public speaking engagement in, to businessmen went, she said, it was easy. All I needed to do was know my stuff, strut it, wear becoming hats, laugh at the right time, and have a good collection of stories about tired businessmen. Frequently from the audience, there comes a question that requires a technical answer. The audience gets that answer, the correct answer, 
and is, I think, surprised. I just love to have an audience shoot hard questions at me. It is my best way for winning. My hearers are surprised to learn that I do know the subjects about which I am talking. They are surprised, surprised I believe, because I am a woman. So you get the sense that a lot of people, and by people I mean men, did not quite know what to make of her. The tone of all of her articles and interviews come off with an incredulous vibe that one, she is making the point she's making at all, and two, with an air of surprise in themselves that they were also convinced after hearing her speak. And this little clipping in the middle of the slide here, documenting that she spoke at a convention of the Public Utilities Association of Virginia saying, Miss Steiner is known as the sweetheart of the electrical industry is an electrical engineer and incidentally the highest paid woman in the industry in the United States. I never heard, I've, I've, I never heard her anywhere else described as an electrical engineer. However, I believe that she knew the electrical industry well enough that she proved to a whole room of men that she was to be taken seriously. So she entertained speaking engagements all across Ohio and all over the country. One speaking engagement in 1928 brought her to a conference of bankers in Ohio where she met the banker Franklin Rice of Dayton. The story goes that he was her chauffeur for the evening and after her speech was over and while he was taking her back to the hotel, he said, if your speech makes it into the newspaper, I will send you a copy. And she replied that where she goes to speak, she is accustomed to making the front page. And Franklin was so impressed by this that when her article did make it into the paper, he drove all the way up to Lorraine to deliver it to her. So soon after that, they started dating, they got engaged, and then they were married in New York City in January of 1929. Franklin came from a very wealthy family and she entered into a new life of luxury in her marriage to Franklin. The relationship brought her into a new and wealthy class of society for her getting married in New York City. The picture here is at their prenuptial dinner of their wedding in a fancy hotel in New York City. So just imagine the height of the Roaring Twenties lifestyle. And I think that she was comfortable with it and likely enjoyed it. I think she wanted excitement in her life. Immediately after their wedding, they honeymooned for, honeymooned for a month on a cruise of the Caribbean. Mementos of that time of her life are film reels documenting their journey and a large and carefully direct, decorated scrapbook of postcards, photographs, and ephemera from their travels. The cruise became one of the first of many that Helen would take in her life. Her new life of wealth is evident in a long list of wedding presents and a long list of itemized luggage lists for the cruise. And the 14 room home in Dayton, Ohio that they moved into upon their return, pictured here. The yard is decorated with just married signs to celebrate their return. However, this is of course 1929. So in October of that year was the stock market crash or Black Tuesday. Franklin's wealth was heavily invested in the stock market. And after the crash, Franklin, like many people, believed the stock market would bounce back. Therefore, he bought up more stock at cheap prices with the hope that they would soon see a return of their wealth. This was not the case. To make matters worse, worse Franklin and Helen were feeling pressure from the Rice family to keep up appearances. So we're being supported by the Rice family to pay the mortgage and heating bill for their large home. Helen was comfortable with earning her, away, earn, earning her own way, so she resumed her speaking engagements to provide an income and help get them out of debt. Franklin's brother Elwood was supplying them checks to cover their expenses. Franklin's inability to find new work and Helen's efforts to bring in dollars became a point of contention with Elwood in 1932. Helen wrote a letter in response to a phone call from Elwood in 1932 in this way. This is one of the most difficult letters I have ever written, but it is necessary that we understand each other clearly and definitely once and for all. I've always had the honor of being accepted throughout the industrial and professional world as a broad-minded woman giving unbiased decisions and meeting all problems fairly and squarely, and what's more facing facts and not dodging them. Nobody in God's world wants Franklin working more than I do. It means my life, my future happiness. I have everything at stake. To you, it means material things. Your necessity, as you term it, is measured in dollars. Mine in heart throbs. There's no comparison. So please never act as though I was not doing all in my power to get him back into harmony with his being and reestablished. Now about the several thousand dollars you threw in my face repeatedly yesterday. I appreciate it, but read this through several times. 
I may be a silly little pep talker in your opinion, and I let you get away with a lot of things just to avoid arguments, but I can read you like a book. So she then overviews various expenses and says, we had $5 between us in starvation when you finally sent the last $50, which is gone about now. And she concludes, I want you to take this letter as I have written it, fairly and with not a grain of animosity in my being. So I kind of get the sense that she had a bit of fire in her. Sometime in 1931, while delivering a speech on women in the workplace, she was noticed by the president of the son of the founder of the Gibson Art Company in Cincinnati. He recommended her for a position to survey and offer suggestions for improvement on the company. Therefore, she moved herself into apartments into an apartment at the Gibson Hotel in Cincinnati. She worked during the week and would go back to Dayton or Franklin would come to see her on weekends. Tragically, however, Franklin committed suicide in October of 1932. He wrote a long and carefully typed letter to Helen beforehand though, where it is very clear that he cared deeply for her and wanted her to remember him during their carefree times when he would make the trip up to visit her in Lorraine. He explains how he had been struggling for a while and that he'd come from, from wealth and could not die a common bum. Also very clear was that he was once a banker, always a banker in his sound banking and investment my, in advice that he bestowed upon her in the letter. Although he adds, darling, you know more about how to handle money than I do. So this is a portrait in the slide here that Helen had commissioned in 1933, just a few short months after Franklin's suicide and which it hung in her apartment in Cincinnati. And I can see the sadness in her expression. Life continues and she continues working at Gibson's. After the passing of a colleague at Gibson's, Helen was promoted to editor. She called some of her early humorous verses, the first of the smart Alex in the greeting card business. She started out with simple verses that were popular at the time. She wrote both short and humorous cards as well as longer, more serious cards. As she progressed in her career, she became known for penning poems that were eloquent, inspirational, and that resonated with many people. Sometimes, especially today, her poems come off as excessively sentimental. However, this style was very popular at the height of her career. And these are some of the cards in our collection that she penned. Many people know Helen for being considered the poet laureate of inspirational verse or of greeting cards. In 1960, when Helen was 60 years old, she got her big breakthrough to fame when the night before Thanksgiving, one of her poems was read on the Lawrence Welk show. The first time her poem was read, her name was not given because it was a poem of her Christmas greeting card and normally the authors of greeting card poems are not included. But the show received so many calls inquiring about the author of the poem that the next time one of her poems was read, her name was given. Soon after this, Gibson began printing her name on the cards, then her signature, and then her photograph on the back. A Gibson Company spokesperson said in her New York Times obituary, she was one of the few greeting card writers or artists ever allowed to sign their work because buyers had begun to recognize her style. As her poems became more recognizable, Gibson started printing them in booklet form, on plates, decorative calendars, notebooks, and more. The Praying Hands poem was another one of her big hits and it was widely circulated. So there's the plate in the corner with the praying hands on it. So the image, is here, the image here is just a sampling of some of the um, items we have in our collection. But circling back, let's look at, hear from some of the people who knew her. So Gertie was two years younger than Helen and she started working for the Lorraine City Engineering Department as a clerk in 1924 and she retired 48 years later. Helen was very outspoken and flamboyant in her dress, while Gertie was much more reserved and dressed more simply. While Helen could be described as loud, Gertrude had a quiet way of speaking with carefully chosen words. While they had their fair share of sisterly squabbles, I got a real kick out of a letter Helen wrote to Gertie addressed, Dear Ding Bat One, and then the letter, and then she signed it from Ding Bat Two. Such a sisterly thing to do. Gertie would type a letter to Helen at the end of each day and mail it, and Helen would call Gertie about once a week. And they would 
visit each other often throughout the year. In the warmer months, Gertie would go to Cincinnati and in, no, opposite of that. In the colder months, Gertie would go to Cincinnati and vice versa, Helen would come up to Lorraine. Helen became, became good friends with the Gratison family of Cincinnati, Willis Gratison Sr. and his wife, Dorothy. Their son, Bob, refers to Ellen as Aunt Helen in his letters. There's more to be explored in their friendship, but I wanted to read to you an excerpt from a letter that Willis sent to Gertrude. In the letter, he is thanking Gertie for a gift, but also goes on to describe Helen, as I would say, in her element, while on one of her cruise excursions in 1936. So that's when she was about 36 years old. You no doubt are aware that you are blessed with a remarkable sister, but nevertheless, I feel that I must tell you a bit about her tonight. There are some 700 passengers from all sections of the country, all types and descriptions. Of all the people here, none have the charm, the beauty, and personality of Helen. This is not my personal opinion, but the combined consensus of the passengers. But even more noticeable, the officers of the ship. She is invited nightly to special parties by the dignitaries of the ship, and out of courtesy, the rest of us are asked merely as escorts. To be with Helen, with her vivacity, her spontaneity, and originality, is to have the best tonic in the world. To say she scatters sunshine is to put it mildly. We are very grateful that she is with us and only regret that you and mother are not here. Think, thanking you and with kindest regards and best wishes, sincerely, Willis Gratison Sr. She also, of course, amassed many friends from work. One being a coworker of 17 years, Bob Reese. In a letter from 1977, Bob writes to Helen, God is so good to me to share in your life, works and friendship. I continuously thank him for that gift. I wish I could share or be the instrument of furthering your works even more and someday perhaps that will happen. I believe I could thoroughly dedicate my life to continuing and expanding the work that God has given you. So this is an account of Helen much later in her life when she was in her 70s. She touched many lives during her life. Her closeness with her religion became more apparent as she got older, and, I also, and also I think an understanding of the impact of her spiritual writing also became a part of her personality. She received thousands of letters from people who were inspired and affected by her poems. She commonly described herself as a simple person, person which I agree on one hand is true, especially as she became more seasoned in life. But when you remember the quote from Willis, and then compare it with Bob's, you definitely notice a significant contrast. In an interview from 1976, an article stated, she discourages visits and interviews because she says they, the people, do not realize that in meeting me, they are just meeting themselves, for the same God who abides in them abides in me, and he reaches from heart to heart. In an interview, also in the 70s, and the interviewer described her as such. Miss Rice feels that the world is drab and dreary for many of us. Therefore, each person owes it to the other to add a note of cheer. This Miss Mrs. Rice does by both her physical surroundings and through her verse. Her office is brightened by two yellow filing cabinets. Each book and booklet is autographed with a different color pen. Color, in fact, also plays a large part in her dress. Her eyeglass frames, dress, stockings, and shoes are always of one color, with purple being her favorite. Her beautiful skin and lovely, lovely blonde hair often set off by large ornate hats. The reasons she gives for her attire are simple. God created so much beauty in this physical world. Why should we humans not do the same in others? I like to make people smile. So then we're gonna pause and play a little game where I want each of you to just think about what color hat you think this is. And remember, she usually would dress head to toe in one color. So this is a whole color choice. I know you can't, I can't hear what you're saying, but I'm just, you just all think about it for a second. All right, I'm gonna advance to the next slide and do the reveal. It's green. Green feathers and green gemstones. This is a very large hat. And we also have two pairs of green shoes and another green flowery hat in our collection. I'm not sure why we have so much green when purple was her favorite color, but that's the way it is. So 
So let's look at her relevance to today. Helen experienced several health setbacks in her later years in life and lived in a lot of pain. Helen passed away in 1981 at the age of 80 and is buried in, at Elmwood Cemetery in Lorraine. And before I wrap up, I'd like to conclude with my thoughts on how Helen Steiner Rice is relevant to today. Over 7 million books of her poetry have sold, not including the numbers of cards containing her poems on them. Her writing clearly touched a significant number of the population at one time. People who have written about her and Helen herself acknowledged her talents and being able to articulate emotions through poems so eloquently, which was impacted by the personal tragedies she faced. She received thousands of letters, almost like fan mail, from people writing to tell her how much one of her poems inspired them or helped them through a hard time. In a magazine interview in 1969, she is thus described, this petite, vivacious woman has the rare gift of sensing the needs of the average person. Her formula, if you wanna call it that, is to encourage her readers to have faith. Helen says, if my poems do anything, I believe they help people find satisfaction of living life to its fullest. God's gifts are all around us, but so many people who receive them don't seem to be aware of them. And sometimes it seems to me that they never fully enjoy them. Her personality and complexity as a person is inspiring. Someone who embraced who she was, was unapologetic and stood up for herself, whether in arguments and letters, in a room full of men or quoted in newspapers. For example, this article here, Cincinnatian and ex-Cincinnatian dispute title of Christmas card verse champion. The honor of being America's most prolific Christmas card verse writer became a matter of national interest Thursday. The controversy began with a United Press dispatch from Massachusetts which reported that Mrs. Vela Edwards, who once lived in Cincinnati and worked at Gibson's, claimed the world championship with a record 100,000 verses written in 24 years of service. The editor of the Gibson Art Company now is pretty Helen Steiner Rice, who notified of the title's claimant, the title claimant's assertion exploded, how many, 100,000? Did she call that a record? I've been in the business six years and I've written 500,000 greeting card verses. That's a conservative estimate. And finally, her thoughts on women's rights. The article from the Miami Beach Sun here from 1955, where she is quoted, men rarely give women credit for having any brains or ability in a field they consider their own and asserting, we will someday see a woman president, a woman in the presidential chair. Her attitudes promoting and supporting women in the workplace makes you wonder what path of life she would have taken if she had gone on to receive her law degree and become a congresswoman. However, she lived a full life with a remarkable career and was outspoken at every turn, especially on women's rights. Note that she never asked women to work harder or change themselves to work in a man's world. She asked men, those who were predominantly in power at the time, to do the changing, to make room for women, to respect what women have to offer, and to promote and respect women as valuable assets to the work, workforce. Here are my sources. And then I wanna thank you all for joining us here today. Um, and I am gonna see, if you have questions, you can type them in the chat feature. Um, should be at the bottom of your screen or maybe the top of your screen. Um, I think maybe while we wait for some people to type in the chat box their questions, um, I have one of my own. Um, if there is, I mean, you obviously submerged yourself in Helen's life and history to deliver this presentation for us today. Um, but if there's one thing that you want people to know about Helen Steiner Rice, what would it be? Um, that's a really good question. There are so many things. I would want her to be remembered for her activism in her youth and the guts she had to just walk into a room of 500 men and command the audience for however long she spoke. And just her charisma in being able to do that and the messages she was so adamantly trying to spread that women should be promoted. You have amazing women already in your workforce, but if you only keep them like she said, at stenographer's desks, or you never promote them or ask them to do anything more, then you're not giving them opportunities to advance and show you what they can do. So I just really think that her activism and her youth is really inspiring. And I'm jealous 
of her confidence in doing all that. <laughs>